Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining today's How Do Renters Cope with Unaffordability? Household Level Impact of Rental Cost Burdens in Los Angeles. Before we begin, please ensure that you have opened the WebEx participant and chat panels by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. Please note, all audio connections are currently muted. This conference is being recorded. You are welcome to submit written questions throughout the webinar, which will be addressed at the Q&A sessions of the webinar. To submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, then enter your question in the message box provided and send. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. With that, I'll turn the webinar over to Christopher Taylor, Director of Field Operations. Christopher, please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, good morning, uh, depending on where you are. Thank you for joining today's call, which will highlight what I consider to be a great example of how an amazing data partner can help a trauma zone really achieve their goals. Um, just as a personal note, um, I think this is an extremely important call um, because I've per personally seen the effects of a highly rent burden area um, and how that can really affect citizens who are trying to find basic housing uh, in a highly cost area. Um, I used to personally think this was um, a myth almost. Um, I even saw, uh, I'll be very honest, videos about this on certain social media platforms, but it was really eye-opening to recently take a trip out to LA and actually see people living in their cars and other mediums, um, really because they can't afford to have a decent place. So I think this call is extremely timely. Um, I do want to recognize a few people on this call. Um, first, um, who really is leading our place-based efforts for our headquarters team, Jill Yu. Um, thank you so much for pulling this call together. Uh, I also want to recognize a few members of her team, um, Colin Evenson, who should be on the call today, and Romel Calderwell. Um, and last but not least, um, an important individual from our LA field office, who is really our point person for both of the uh, LA Promise Zone, Angela Wong. Thank you again for being on today's call. Uh, we brought this presentation together for a handful of reasons. First off, we simply want to recognize the good work that Promise Zones are doing across the country. The USC Price School of Public Policy has been an amazing valued partner of both the LA Promise Zone and Slate Z, and they do great work with, within various communities in the Los Angeles area communities. Secondly, I believe this is a great example of Group D data and of the partnership between Promise Zones and their data partners. For the sake of evaluation, as well as goal setting, each Promise Zone designation agreement outlines four types of data to be collected by HUD and the Promise Zone. This presentation today is an amazing example of what we call Group D data. Group D data is information that must be manually collected locally because it's not routinely collected by public agencies, it is not publicly available. Because of this, it is the most difficult and or expensive data to collect. However, it's also probably the most valuable because the data collectors can define how and what data is collected, meaning it is locally informed, and this ultimately provides important context and insight into what is happening locally in communities and households. This demonstrates the value of a data partner to a promise zone. What this data shows is a snapshot of what Promise Zone residents are experiencing, which is vital for community development goals that Promise Zones work towards. Lastly, we thought this presentation would be valuable because it demonstrates the value that local community networks, like Promise Zones, can contribute to research being done locally. Since Promise Zone partners are generally working locally and oftentimes directly with households, they can help research institutions with both outreach for data collection, as well as with providing important guidance on how the research should be done, what questions to ask, and how to define variables. And now, with further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Gary Painter and the U.S. research team. Thanks so much for doing this call today. <laughs> 
Thank you so much. Um, my name is Gary Painter. As you said, I direct the Price Center for Social Innovation, and myself and my colleagues are very pleased to share this research with you and also share a little bit of, a, of the journey of how our partnership with the two LA Promise Zones has evolved. I also wanted to thank Jill and the team at headquarters at HUD. I wanted to thank Eric and Angela, the HUD liaisons in Los Angeles, and Elder, who's here with us today, and many members of, of the Promise Zone leadership over the last five years. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about the journey, and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues to share about the, the research itself. Um, it, it, it did begin quite a number of years ago. Back in 2014, the Price Center for Social Innovation joined the LA Promise Zone as the evaluation partner, and I also personally became a member of the Leadership Council once that designation was awarded. That was a very exciting time in Los Angeles, but what is even more exciting was the opportunity to take the next step, and, and, and I, a group in South Los Angeles uh, kind of came together, forged a partnership, and we were able to also serve as an evaluation partner. This second promise zone is known as Slate Z in Los Angeles. And as we were kind of building this partnership, especially with the first LAPZ, uh, for those of you who are on this call know much about promise zone, those first designated promise zones actually did not have a strict strategic plan set of strategic priorities when they actually became designated, whereas those designated in round two and three were required to put that forward as part of their application. So our first year, we worked quite hard uh, to really lay out what did the community want to achieve. And I think uh, my colleague Elder is going to go into a little more detail there, but I just wanted to know we came up with quite a nice grid of how we were going to attack these problems. We were going to focus on economic opportunity, educational outcomes, building sustainable and livable communities, and making neighborhoods safe. And we really dug down to figure out what sorts of metrics could we look at and track. Where did these metrics exist? Did they exist in secondary data? Did they exist in, in data that just wasn't being collected? And so we began a process of tracking and, and, and supporting this work. And so over the next few years, we worked with both LAPZ and Slate Z partners to apply for a series of federal grants as, you know, we're favored in the Promise Zones, but also worked with local funders to try to um, create, you know, research and support and data and evaluation to support the work that was happening on the ground. Uh, we worked with Slate Z by and secured a, a data use agreement with the Los Angeles Unified School District to be able to track educational outcomes there. And we actively sought resources, primarily philanthropic in this case, um, but would certainly welcome additional support from the federal government to support our analyses with secondary data. And we actually launched a neighborhood data platform here in L.A. County called Neighborhood Data for Social Change. Um, and as was noted by our introducer, our, our convener today, um, these secondary data are essential for tracking change over time but they don't tell the whole story. And for in HUD language, the Group A data, federal sources, B and C, other kind of state and local sources, often don't tell the story of why a particular phenomenon is getting better or worse. In particular, one of the metrics that we were tracking in these two promise zones was the, the rate of rent burden, whereas rent burden is defined as the percentage of, of income that you pay as rent. And what we saw, especially in the LAPZ, was that this rate of rent burden was accelerating at, at quite a high rate. Um, and so it became incumbent upon us to figure out what sorts of policy action or practices needed to happen. And to that end, um, what we did is we engaged on kind of like an understanding that we needed additional research to understand how families were coping with this rising rent burden to determine these appropriate interventions. And so long story short, we were finally able to secure major grant support from a local, a local foundation that focuses their work in Los Angeles, and that's the Haynes Foundation. We also received support from a couple of USC centers, including the USC Price Center and the USC Lusk Center to conduct this work. But I'm going to leave it to my colleagues to tell a little bit about how we got there because it certainly wasn't just simply you submit a grant and you're good to go, but actually a much more involved, engaged experience with our community partners in the L.A. Promise Zones and certainly marshalling their support to move us to this point. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Giovanna Rosen,
who is a partner at the Price Center and is now a professor at Rutgers University. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, next, I'll be talking about how this research project evolved into a survey. So beyond the Promise Zone work group, um, Beyond the Promise Zone work groups, this research was really motivated by coinciding academic interests, as well as a real trend that we observed towards housing affordability organizing among all the Price Center partners across the LA region. This includes community partnerships with the two LA Promise Zones, as Gary discussed, as well as Price Philanthropies in San Diego and Lift to Rise, a collective impact initiative in the Coachella Valley. So across these different areas, we saw that partners are becoming increasingly concerned about housing issues and starting to organize in that area, even organizations that aren't traditionally operating in the housing space. And in addition, we saw that rent burden or high rent to income ratios were emerging from the quantitative data as a key indicator of vulnerability, even in lower cost areas such as the Coachella Valley. But partners similarly uh, told us that they did not have enough syst uh, systematic information on how residents were impacted. We began talking to residents first with exploratory focus groups and listening sessions. And as we talked to people, we began to see evidence of nuanced and community impacts from rent burden and the complex drivers of housing precarity and unaffordability. Necessary information to effectively support residents, but also uh, things that we, we didn't expect to see. So in turning to the academic literature, as we tend to do, uh, we saw a real knowledge gap around these issues. And so we saw an opportunity to do a larger project that both met the needs of community partners who are working to respond uh, to the housing affordability crisis in real time without enough information, as well as to bring new insight into academic spaces. So I'm sure we're all happy to talk to you more about the academic research and how this project fits in. But for now, I say all of this to describe that uh, between the organizing efforts on the ground and a real gap in our academic understanding, we had a unique opportunity to build a broader research project, which would require a substantial amount of time and for which we would need to secure outside funding. And as my colleagues will describe, by doing such a large scale rigorous survey, we were able to draw conclusions about entire populations and geographies. So we decided to begin with focus groups because, as I mentioned in the academic literature, we lacked a deep understanding of all the sources of rent burden. And before we launched a survey, we wanted to have a real understanding of what we wanted to ask. Um, but this also allowed us to get started on the research more immediately using internal funding from the Lust Center at USC and the Price Center while applying for bigger grants to fund the survey, which we all know can take a longer time frame than we want that grant seeking process. So we were able to secure internal funds and eventually external funds because we designed the research in a way that we were intending to make an academic contribution. Again, kind of hitting that sweet spot across academic and practitioner research, answering important outstanding research questions through rigorous research design. The focus groups, though, allowed us to gather information in depth and build new hypotheses around the stories we heard of people's coping strategies and the effects on their lives, much more complicated than just uh, the housing affordability story that's normally told. And these new ideas helped inform the survey, building a study that was informed by the ways in which residents reported that they were being impacted and how affordability affected their lives. And again, our goal was always to conduct a large-scale survey to understand patterns at a population level for the reasons that Gary previously mentioned and across communities. But by beginning with this inductive approach, we were able to develop additional information around the initial support, um, social support hypotheses to be able to test at scale generated by our engaged work with community partners. And this, the, our focus group approach fundamentally transformed our survey protocol. So next I'll pass it to Sean, who will discuss the survey in further depth. Great, thanks so much, Giovanna, for that overview. I'm gonna take the next couple minutes to dive a little bit deeper into our research approach um, that Giovanna kind of highlighted here over the last uh, few slides. And so we began by taking an iterative and collaborative approach to this project. This began with focus groups, like we talked about, to hone the question protocol and to gain a deeper uh, understanding of the array of issues related to housing stability that perhaps isn't always immediately obvious to outsiders. We then engaged with participants who had uh, been a part of the focus groups by releasing initial results as a community flyer to keep that sort of engagement alive. We took what we learned from the initial analysis and decided to go further to test the validity by implementing the large widespread survey. And now we've begun to share out results from the survey via formal reports and policy briefs, as well as a dedicated website that will contain not only data and findings, but resources that are available to community members. 
And so this iterative process allowed us to ensure that all priorities were able to benefit from the relationships that we form, both community members, local organizations, the private zones, and ourselves as researchers. Um, and then we were asking the questions that needed to be asked, right? Those that would be useful to not only, you know, policymakers and ourselves as researchers, but also the partners on the ground doing the work, and that it was in fact reflective of the experiences of residents, uh, first and foremost, whose lives are directly impacted. So first to this meant thinking through our own goals for the project, right? We realized that if policy and political impact were truly a goal for this research, we need to engage directly with those already on the ground taking part. It needed to be connected to lived experiences, our own interests, like I mentioned, and ongoing campaigns of local orgs. And we needed to engage with those organizing, those that had a political base that could do something, right, with the findings after our research portion of the project had concluded. And so we had a general idea of the grave situation of housing instability in L.A., um, and we knew, to, we knew that we wanted to provide support for those experiencing those conditions. And if we were serious, that this work took responsibility, right, to think deeply on what positive collaboration and partnerships would look like and feel like, and it also would take additional training on our end to make sure that everyone that was a part of the project, going from undergrad all the way up to ourselves, were both culturally competent, being outsiders and staff on the project, and then we were being respectful of the communities that we were entering into. Um, and so that is all to say, to really encapsulate, that this took real effort and real work, right? It's not just something that occurred naturally. From the beginning, it's something that we always had built into the project and were really focusing on. And it began by identifying key partners, of which the Promise Zones really were incredibly useful, incredibly powerful, uh, and a natural fit, because they had already be formed this incredible network of people and organizations, they had local knowledge, and they knew where the infrastructures of support and resistance were already underway, right? What was already in place trying to sort of navigate the various issues that folks were facing? And so these partners provided crucial insight as we co-designed the question protocol, sitting down with the organizers, asking how we should phrase it, if there's additional questions that we are missing, um, and also how to engage harder-to-reach populations, right? How do we navigate the neighborhoods that we'd be surveying within? And so this really allowed us to establish trust. Um, because often, as, as some folks may know, academic research, not often, but at times, academic research universities can enter in a community, gather data, and then exit, right? Perhaps with a white paper or report to follow. But we really wanted to think through how do we continue to bridge throughout data collection findings and then back to the community through each part. And so one example of what this kind of looked like in practice was when we were developing the uh, question protocol, it became clear from organizers that there was this direct need for information of simply what services and resources were available. It was hard for residents to navigate to find out what was out there. And so we realized that with very basic training of our staff and putting together what we call the resource directory, which was a packet of about 15 pages that listed food banks, community health centers, free law services, utility subsidies, youth development, things related to the conversations we were having in the focus group, that we could provide services right then and there. Um, so by creating this resource directly, giving ourselves this base level of training, we could wait around for 30 to 45 minutes after the session and point people in the right direction, at least to say, hey, I'm having this issue, here are a group of people that you should talk to, right? And so thinking through how we could be not only as least attractive as possible, which is certainly key, but also how we can uh, sort of be, give base level case management or be actualizing some of the burdens the residents were facing in the moment in even small ways, right? And then extrapolating that out to constantly think how we can be delivering resources as well as getting the information that we need for the larger project on multiple scales. And so this type of thinking will continue to uh, live on through our rollout strategy moving forward as we create the website, we share results back out to orgs, and we form shorter research summaries that are more focused on organizing and community engagement work. Um, and so ultimately, the success of the project really came down to what are we talking about here? Equitable relationships, right? And, and foremost, beginning at the grassroots uh, level and the people that really built this project that we wouldn't have been able to done it without are the community members, right? Who gave generous amounts of time and were vulnerable in sharing intimate details of their private lives. 
And so we gave $25 uh, for one hour focus groups and $20 for the 15-minute uh, survey, equivalent roughly to a livable wage. It also meant providing interpretation services and language justice, everything being translated to English and Spanish, and at times for certain sessions offering simultaneous interpretation, so it allowed for sharing and community to form in real time amongst neighbors, sort of bridging that language barrier. Um, and, and last but not least, it, it also definitely benefited us because it allowed us to be more imaginative, to think outside the constraints of traditional sort of research or academic study. We are encouraged by residents to also ask, res, uh, ask residents the way they were already receiving support and already resistant which forced us now to think about how policy interventions should be reflective of that, right? Reinforcing infrastructure already in place rather than creating something new. And we also integrated a radical imagination exercise at the end to ask participants to dream together, right? What is their ideal housing situation? What would be needed to get there? And what type of policies could facilitate making this dream a reality? Um, and so this is certainly not to say a few things we've learned along the way, because I know we have lots of partners here. It's certainly not to say that, that we did this perfect, right, or that all of our relationships were free from extraction. But what we are saying is that we made this a specific focus, and we continue to find ways to improve as we go through with the rollout and as we expand this into additional projects and additional areas of focus. And so at the center, we talk a lot about collective impact networks, and I think that provides some valuable insight into how research might be set up in the future as we consider how do we better engage with partners, how do we make sure they're fairly compensated, how are we sharing data fluidly, and ultimately, I think a big thing is acquiring flexible sort of umbrella funding so that those resources can be shared widely and we can think a little bit wider. Two, uh, a few ideas that we had come up with when unfortunately didn't iterate uh, in this portion of the project, but again, sharing some ideas that we did have, were hiring local organizers to serve as the survey managers, given their on-the-ground insight um, and, and, and knowing sort of their knowledge of harder to reach populations. Hiring local community members to engage in the survey collection uh, as well, right? And thinking about ways that the training and experiences that that could have provided would form a more sustainable and semi-permanent or permanent infrastructure after academic research concludes that those community members and organizers now have that skill set to leverage and turn into their own projects, right, or, or sort of find out their own data uh, once sort of us as formal researchers exit. And then last, I would say earmarking funds for campaign and organizing work that would go directly to organizations after the conclusion of the study that could follow from the, stu uh, follow from the findings, right? So again, how do we really think about this pipeline and how do we think about it at multiple scales throughout the partnership to really make sure that these relationships are as equitable as possible and that also that we're, we're driving questions that need to be answered and want to be answered by those on the ground who are directly being impacted. Um, and so I think, you know, just to kind of wrap up this section, um, what that will entail is, is recognizing residents as experts and reframing local knowledge and policy discussions and really bringing that up and making that as important of data as sort of any of the other data we've discussed here uh, in the opening remarks today. And this requires research to focus on actionable and relevant findings that are important to all parties. And so with that, I'm going to transition and speak a little bit uh, indirectly to the uh, areas that we studied and, and the survey logistics before I hand it over to Soledad to talk through our findings. Um, so where are we located? Uh, as previously mentioned, we focused on Central and South Los Angeles. That's the Los Angeles Promise Zone and Slate Z, the South Los Angeles Promise Zone. Um, and they both have high rent compositions and high rent burden. But they also hold important differences in their demographic composition, and specifically among immigrant populations. I mean, we also know that they face varied development pressures with gentrification and new construction. This occurred at an earlier rate and faster with uh, Los Angeles Promise Zone uh, further to the north, whereas this is definitely occurring in South LA, but it's more recent in the past year. So we also have this sort of varying degree to which these uh, new pressures are emerging as well, or, or re-emerging, I should say, after the uh, recession. Um, and then, so it allowed us to both study a, a complete cross-section of the L.A. Basin, right? We can see you know, this almost straight through line of, of a variety of populations, but also being able to compare uh, nuanced differences that exist as well. 
Um, and so with the survey logistics, we've touched upon much of this already, so I'll just go quickly through it. We conducted the survey January through October 2019. We made sure everyone was compensated, as you can see here. We approached roughly 11,000 addresses, which yielded 790 complete surveys and a, a rough response rate of 16%, although that's a, low, a lower bound to the estimate. We're still sort of working on refining that. Um, it's a lot of sort of paperwork to, to trace every, all 11,000 of those addresses back, but, but we'll have it shortly. Um, and, and I think the thing to touch upon perhaps most in survey uh, logistics is the geographically stratified randomized sample. After doing the focus groups, we really wanted to make sure that this was valid, that it was substantiating or challenging our findings in a way uh, that wasn't prone to bias. And so we randomized each of the census plot groups, chose them uh, randomly, as we said, of course, uh, and then even within that, again, randomized all the addresses uh, that were purchased um, to make sure that we had a complete list and so uh, that the populations will be, um, you know, free from any uh, uh, systemized sort of changes that we can be confident that the estimates and sort of findings uh, that result from this work is not the product of who we surveyed, but are actually representative, again, of the population and those that we were talking through. Um, and so quickly, what did we talk about? Uh, it began with a two-year housing history, everywhere folks had lived, as well as um, some of the uh, maintenance and landlord sort of issues or non-issues that they had faced. We talked through the employment and demographic information of each person in the household. We understood what type of consumption trade-offs they were making and supports they had available. And then finally, we looked at sort of some of those outside conditions with their housing and neighborhood, and then ultimately we're interested in, you know, how collectively the variety, all these, you know, sort of multi-faceted objects of resistance, of support, of trade-offs, of the pressures of income and, 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 and housing, how do those result in outcomes along with eviction related to stress, related to health, and then ultimately discrimination as well. And the last thing I'll say before handing it over to Soledad is about our sample and just thinking through who was able to respond to this survey. Um, it was a powerful cross-section and I think a, a good group of people that were experiencing this firsthand and needed to be talked to. Um, but those are the folks that are still there, right? Folks that um, are absolutely vulnerable um, and that policy needs to be designed to, to address and help them achieve greater stability. But we also need to recognize that there are those who have already been displaced and thinking through, again, other research in the future, who we're talking to and how we can continue to reach those folks that perhaps aren't present um, in this exact study. And so with that, I will hand it over to Soledad for our uh, findings, and uh, thank you all so much. Thank you, Sean. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, I'll add just quickly a, a note, a question in the map, uh, in the chat about the map. Um, we, the map doesn't coincide exactly with the promise zones. They were roughly, um, the idea was to roughly um, um, cover the, the promise zones. They didn't go directly just because they cover different sections within census tracts and block groups. So, so that was just logistically. Um, that's why slate C won't look exactly as it is in the, in, in the promise zone. Um, and then turning to the findings, I'll, I'm gonna highlight our six main findings here. And as a note, this picture here, you can see two of our surveyors approaching a house where one of the units was randomly selected to be surveyed. And our first finding reveals that a majority of households are actually making cutbacks to afford rent. Um, most residents reported making significant trade-offs within the past two years, and these include the fact that more than half of households are cutting back on food, clothing, entertainment, and family activities, and they are also taking on additional debt. And the highest category here is food, where 62% of households reported reducing their expenses in this category on food in one way or another. And more than one third of households reported reducing their transportation expenses and one in five um, have cut back on education and health and medical expenses. Um, and our second finding is that rent burden households are more likely to make trade-offs overall to make life more affordable than non-rent burdened households and that they are also more likely to make trade-offs in specific categories. So as we can see here in the chart, 
we observe statistically significant differences across rent burden status, where rent burden households, the blue bars, are more likely than non-rent burden households, the green bars, to have made cutbacks in food, health and medicine, clothing, and transportation. And this is important because it confirms prior studies that find that rent burden forces households to make impactful cutbacks that ultimately affect resident quality of life. So although we see a majority of households making these, house, these adjustments, rent burden households are more likely to make them. And our third household comes from uh, beyond asking folks what they were going without in order to make rent, we also ask them to estimate for how long they have been making these uh, trade-offs. Their answers suggest that many of the cutbacks they describe are not temporary coping strategies, but instead they're becoming semi-permanent quality, quality of life differences. And to illustrate this, here we graphed all rent burdened households that reported cutting back on each category. And each color is a time frame with the blue hues covering from zero months to one year and the green hues covering from one to five or more years. And at first glance, we can see that for, most, for almost all categories, more than 50% of households, the, fifth, the, the red line, sorry, uh, have been making cutbacks for over six months. And furthermore, we see that over one-third of all rent burden households, the red dotted line there, have been cutting back on each of these categories for over a year in order to make life more affordable. So these adjustments and trade-offs folks are making are not a one-off short-term fix that the they are actually becoming more enduring adjustments that are likely affecting their quality of life. And the fourth um, finding is looking at the same data but now comparing between these two survey areas. And we observe that households in LAPZ in central Los Angeles are more likely to come back on health, education, and family activities and entertainment than households in Slate Z in South LA. The differences in the other categories are not statistically significant um, and not graphed here, but we also find that the cutbacks have been slightly more recent for rent burden households in Slate C than in LAPZ. So overall, folks in LAPZ and Central Los Angeles have been making trade-offs for longer, and they are more likely to make trade-offs in health, education, and entertainment activities compared to folks in Slate C. And our fifth finding, um, this one was a little bit more surprising. We did not find very different rent burden rates and cutbacks across U.S. born households and immigrant households. Um, first, here we are defining immigrant households as those where all adults have been born abroad and U.S. born households have at least one U.S. born adult member in the understanding that having been born in the U.S. opens many doors and opportunities that are closed to non-U.S. born adults. So at least having one U.S. born adult should um, open some of those doors for the rest of the, of the household. Um, and U.S. born households reported greater cutbacks in some cases, and these were attributable to recent cutbacks within the past three months. This was really surprising, as I mentioned, because as we observed, uh, we had observed important differences in impacts and coping strategies in the focus groups that Sean alluded to across these populations. Um, this actually doesn't mean that there are not important differences across groups. Rent burden rates of U.S. foreign households appear largely driven by their higher rents, which are at least partially attributable to their greater housing consumption. So they are more likely to live in single family homes and have more, which have more bedrooms per household member, and they also have a greater likelihood to have moved in the, to their current housing more recently within the previous two years. So these differences suggest that immigrant and U.S. households make different housing-related decisions, which create similar rent burden trade-offs, sorry, similar rent burden rates and trade-off decisions despite different income levels. So it appears that our findings on cutbacks are conditional on functional adjustments to residents' day-to-day -day life, such as crowding and housing choices that immigrant households have already made. So it's important to highlight that these are not all choices. Households make major housing adjustments first and consumption cutbacks come down um, later. 
uh, they come along the margins closer and closer to the threshold of her survival as, as families are, are, um, are struggling more and more. And finally, our sixth finding, um, it stems from asking respondents what they would do if they had an unanticipated $400 expense. This is a question you may be familiar with because it is used by the Fed in their report on economic well-being of, the, of U.S. households. And so what we did, we took that same a question um, and included it in our survey. And respondents could select multiple options, which is why these numbers um, do not total to 100%. And the results we found, first, one in five residents reported that they would not be able to pay for this expense. 40% reported that they would uh, need to take on additional debt, and 27% would need to piece together multiple sources to pay for the expense. And the differences in ability to pay and the likelihood of using family support were statistically significant across rent burden and non-rent burden households, which suggests these groups vary in meaningful ways in their access to formal and informal support. So rent burden households were significantly more likely to be enabled to cover the expense and also more unlikely to turn to family or friends for support in covering that expense. This suggests not only that rent burden households are stretched thin and cannot cover the expense themselves, but also that their networks are, uh, are stretched thin and cannot support one another. And with that, I turn it back to Giovanna. Hi, everyone. So I have the pleasure of wrapping up here. Um, you know, so what are the broader takeaways from these findings? First, it's really important to remember that we surveyed just prior to the pandemic, and this really underscores that even though we're having very important conversations about a very real and impending evictions crisis, the foundation that the pandemic entered into was already incredibly shaky. Renters were already experiencing enormous precarity, and so our conversations cannot focus on stabilizing households to restore the pre-pandemic status quo. But uh, instead, we have to address the fundamental long-standing issues that renters face and uh, these market-wide flaws. Uh, in addition, if we want to understand issues of housing instability, we need to look a lot more broadly than at whether or not people are forced to move. We must also understand the circumstances facing those people who work to stay, pay more in rent, and face important impacts that shape their quality of life and future opportunities, which ultimately determines whether families can find stability over the long term. And even though our study focuses on Los Angeles, the broader forces and events we described today are relevant for many cities and places across the nation, since a lot of places are undergoing the same pattern of stagnant wages, escalating housing cost pressure, and as a result, growing budgetary pressures, particularly in light of the pandemic. And then finally, you know, these deep generalizable insights were only possible because we were able to collect primary data through a large survey, uh, which enabled us to observe new patterns, build new insight, and hopefully do it in a way that's directly relevant for partners due to the geographic scope. But uh, it's important that we conclude by asking, what can we do to help people? And um, the good news here is that there's a lot that we can do to help residents gain stability and greater opportunity. In the short term, survival checks um, to stabilize the income side of the housing affordability consideration. And while we have an eviction moratorium in place, we need to ensure that the policies are enforced. We also need to make sure to support small landlords during this time who are more likely to be people of color or lower income landlords and more at risk of losing their places in the event of rent uh, non-payment. Throughout, it's important that we design these support tools with as few barriers to use as possible to ensure that people can easily access designated resources. And then over the long term, you know, we need substant, uh, substantial policy change to address the housing affordability crisis. We need to expand the housing voucher program um, and enforce the act of discrimination that happens against users. Um, and uh, we need to work to build new housing supply done in a way that pro uh, protects existing residents from displacement. And we should explore new tools such as social housing to ensure that new investment in low-income communities occurs with equity and, and inclusion and doesn't just produce gentrification and displacement. And finally, we need to accompany these housing interventions with structural changes to the social safety net to meet people's basic needs in an economic and housing context, where the baseline is that it's difficult for many people to uh, make ends meet. And so um, these, these changes are just deeply important to address the cumulative and interconnected aspects of 
housing unaffordability. So this is just the beginning of the research. If um, you're interested in checking out more, we have a report on the Price Center website, uh, and don't hesitate to reach out. I'll pass it to others next. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I do want to uh, allow for um, questions, so I'm going to kind of provide a little bit of, a, of an abbreviated uh, presentation um, on our behalf. My name is Elder Sanabri. I am with the Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunity um, and specifically manage the Los Angeles Brahma Zone uh, on behalf of the city um, and uh, also support other education-related initiatives. Uh, I did want to quickly start off by providing some context of the partnership um, and reading out loud our uh, our mission statement, which which is the LA Parma Zone Partnership empowers our culturally diverse communities by aligning our efforts and resources to support family success, recognizing the importance of high performing schools and quality educational programs, uh, in public safety, housing on affo housing affordability, and economic opportunity as essential elements of of healthy neighborhoods. Um, I also wanted to, to also provide some baseline data from 2014 um, just to kind of provide context in terms of what the, the population uh, was dealing with at the, at the time of the application in 2014, uh, specifically looking at, at the percentage of, of, of the population living in poverty, 61 percent, uh, the percentage of households earning less than 20,000. Um, 33%, um, and then, of course, the, the rent burden, which um, in 2014 was around 60% as well. Okay. Oops, sorry. Zooming in here. Uh, this is just a, a quick look of our map, I, and I'm not going to dive too deep into, into what that looks like. Um, but I did, in the following uh, picture, I did have a, 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 if you look at the right map, if you take a look at the, um, the transit maps, this is just in, in, critical for us to understand the, the intersection of the boundaries within our promise zone to help us think about rent burden, households, proximity to, to transit lines. And as you can see, our transit lines cut right through the middle of the entirety of the, of the promise zone. Uh, this is just a picture of, of, of different key elements that make up the Promise Zone, um, specifically how it relates to, to, to USC's Price Center for Social Innovation. Um, you know, we have philanthropy, government, and the implementers. And if you look just right there at the at the bottom, um, specifically, you know, a focus on gathering and reporting on, on performance data as well. Uh, this right here is a really critical component uh, of, of, of the work that we do. Um, the actions in which we, we'd like to see uh, and achieve the change uh, in our community. So we have our five, uh, we have our five um, kind of key areas around program service delivery, integrated and coordinated intervention, quality of life, impact on schools, and long-term impact on the LA Promise Zone. Specifically, uh, data collection, uh, analysis, and shared use. You know, we understand that fully developed partnership uh, among residents. Uh, Schools, public and private agencies and businesses must focus on building capacity uh, to support neighborhood revitalization, uh, understanding as well that neighborhoods benefit from strong data management to access and track the effectiveness of services and funding, and building relationships among public and private partners to enhance the capacity for positive growth and development. In this next slide, you know, we were grounded in education. Uh, this, this right here is the, the the, um, the, the change that we were hoping to see, right? And so some of our key principles, key principles here um, is all around achievement-oriented schools being essential to support educational achievement and public safety, change being achieved by serving an entire well-defined neighborhood comprehensively with a well-thought-out pipeline of high-quality programs, services, and partnerships working together with, again, high information flow to develop unified outcomes and results. Um, you know, we, we did understand that programs, activities, uh, associated outcomes must be regularly associated. So, you know, when thinking about, about our partnership with, with USC Soul Price for Center Innovation, we knew early that we needed to add capacity to collect and analyze data and look at, and we looked at a local university to help us with that and ultimately made sense to include them as thought partners in the initiative altogether. Uh, we asked the university to sit on our on our council to help with guiding and advising the initiative, but to also chair the data and evaluation task force uh, from the beginning to help us determine the metrics um, that, that Dr. Gary Painter showed earlier uh, that were going to be used to measure the success of the initiative, but also to help us think through early indicators to consider how we could improve the service delivery of programs. Uh, so when thinking about what how the findings will will will, will kind of uh, inform uh, this theory of action, 
you know, we look to better understand the circumstances in which residents are facing to think through how housing programs that partners are developing could actually provide the support that families need. If we know what channels specifically families are cutting back on, perhaps we can focus on providing relief there without, but without data like this and, and, and the support, it's difficult to, to know. Um, and as we discussed in the previous slide around data collection, analysis, and shared use, uh, data and information through the assessment and evaluation are critical for, for the ongoing improvement of outcomes defined in our Promise Zone application narrative. So being able to provide a platform for partners to look at this data, to discuss the data, whether the data is in agreement with what they're seeing uh, with their own clients and, and, and out in the communities, uh, but also to allow partners to provide feedback and provide additional questions for us to say, okay, we think this is good, but what does this data say about other indicators that perhaps need to be um, assessed as well? This is just a quick look of our, of our governance structure again, just to, just to highlight that um, with, with USC sitting on our leadership council as well, um, and then also uh, chairing our data and evaluation test force, there is, there is kind of a, a streamlined of data information sharing um, from at all levels of our, of our governance structure. This is just a quick picture also of our partnership, just to get a sense of, of who also is helping us collect data on the ground. So this is our strategic plan. As, as, um, as, as you might have seen in the previous slide, we have four working groups, each focused on a specific policy area. Uh, each group tasked with addressing one or multiple objectives set forth in this plan. Specifically, this data helped inform goals one and four um, around creating economic opportunity and uh, preserving, maintaining, and expanding the supply of affordable housing. In 2018, as mentioned earlier in, in today's presentation, we did have the, the USC team attend our neighborhoods working group which was focused on rent burning and partners discussing service enriched housing to talk with our partners and ensure that we'd be open to discussing the project in detail and coverage of the neighborhoods. Um, as we move forward into addressing the newest needs of our families in Los Angeles as a result of economic downturn, social injustice, and the public health crisis, we need baseline data like this to help us inform policy and discussion around new working groups that we're calling collective action networks set around being intentional about action, impact, and outcome with a direct line of support from our leadership council to help address challenges facing the groups and achieve these outcomes. We can use these new collective action networks to provide space for partners to look and analyze data for themselves so we can better inform program and service delivery. This is just a quick snapshot again uh, where, where this data kind of fits into to what, where, what we're trying to achieve and what we're trying to accomplish and better understand um, as it reflects on our strategic plan uh, in more detail. Uh, this is the, the, the first strategic goal again um, around the granting plans and uh, to ad advance private and public development process for key transit oriented de uh, development sites. Uh, this is a, a quick snapshot again, uh, Gary showed this. Uh, just, to, just to highlight um, one of the metrics that we're capturing to understand more detail of rent burden, um, you know, indication as, as the, the numbers are shifting and this report gives us more information about that population. Um, and again, as mentioned again multiple times, uh, that the multiple data that we're, that we're able to look at, part of the data and evaluation work has been focused with our designation agreement, specifically around these four groups of data. Um, not to, not to define each one individually, but again, the, the, the ultimate data uh, that we're looking at, uh, ultimately what we're looking at is Group D data, which, which is why we need a strong university partner to help us understand the local context and work with our 75 partners and how we can take this to inform our decisions as we move forward. And with that, uh, I do want to pass it back to Gary to answer any other questions that folks might have as it pertains to the report. Thank you so much, Elder, and I know that our time is relatively short, so I want to invite those who are with us today on this webinar to reach out directly to the research team. We're happy to answer questions that you have there, engage with us on the website that was shared, um, and we look forward to this as being the beginning of some of the insights that emerged from this large survey. It's certainly nowhere close to the end. Um, there were a couple of questions that I want to raise for my colleagues to share in our short time available. Um, and, and both of them in some ways have to do with kind of local context and differences. And I think the first one I would want to offer to my colleagues um, is, was there anything in the data in terms of differences between the L.A. Promise Zone, the further north, and the south L.A. Promise Zone that you thought were particularly interesting and relevant for this conversation and, and to interpret the results? 
maybe I'll, Giovanna, I'll call on you for, first. And Let me direct it to Soledad. I think um, okay. she has a lot of. Soledad. Okay. Am I unmuted? Yes. Um, well, so I think the main um, difference, as, as, as we mentioned, or as I mentioned in the findings, was that in LAPZ, um, families or households, I should say, they're not necessarily families, all of them, um, have been making larger trade-offs um, for longer than in Slate C, which coincides with these housing pressures that, that are going on um, differently in both neighborhoods. Um, let me think of something else. What else did we look at? Um, I, I can jump in there. Go ahead. Yeah. If you'd like. <clears throat> One thing that we talked about, you all are getting the second round of this uh, webinar. We were actually able to speak with uh, our LA Promise Zone partners last week. And one thing we, we talked about in a little bit more detail during that section, hopefully we're doing better this time, you know, improvement each, each time along. But one thing we talked about that session was in the north, uh, sorry, in the LA Promise Zone in the northern region, there were a higher likelihood or a greater portion of the population cut back on health care and a greater portion had taken on debt. And so we're going to need to tease that out a little bit more um, as we go through the data, but two sort of hypotheses or things that are, are sort of leaning towards it or giving us some evidence um, is what Soledad talked about was really peeling back and understanding the demographics there. And so when we think about healthcare, there is a larger proportion of, of immigrants in the LA Promise Zone. And so we can think about access and how that might um, impact people's ability to find healthcare or being forced to uh, pay out of pocket if they don't have access to health insurance. Um, and then the other thing we talked about was debt and, and kind of thinking through why there would be a lower, uh, sorry, excuse me, a higher likelihood to take on debt um, in that LA promise zone. And there's a few things thinking through that, and I think it gets back to scale, which another que uh, question somebody had was how is this felt locally or, or individually versus community-wide? And so another thing we're going to have to explore is understanding how networks have already been sort of tapped out, right, that this has been going on a long time. And so perhaps in the in the L.A. promise zone to the north, that folks have already tapped into their networks. They've asked to borrow money or, or squeezed in different ways from family and friends to try to make it through. And now, you know, the only people that they have to fall back on is by accessing that debt. And so perhaps that's why why we sort of see that in the $400 question. So those were two big ones I know that jumped out that we sort of talked about in that previous session, but also things that we're going to have to continue to sort of explore, and, and I think we're going to get a fuller picture as we add more variables to the picture and can kind of understand more completely sort of what people are facing and, and what makes them different. Uh, but those are some initial sort of clues um, that we've come up with. Great, and I think Sean kind of highlighted the other question, which has to do with kind of what are the the cutbacks that are going to show up immediately in the local community versus cutbacks that show up in in maybe housing markets, real estate markets, um, other other retail markets that are actually much more broadly regionally shared. Um, I know that that's a subject for future research, but were there any insights? either perhaps only at the anecdotal level, remembering from surveys that were conducted versus versus others, or is this something for future research? I think it's going to be something for future research, and I hope that you do hang with us as we continue to dig into these very, very rich data. Um, I don't see any other questions, and I think we're at time for me to offer just some concluding remarks. I wanted to highlight um, – uh, once again, that part of what we wanted to present today was not just simply results from a study that was conducted, but that to really give a sense for how we, with our partners in LAPZ and Slate Z, really have crafted a partnership and a partnership that, you know, um, led us through what I have come to, to call in, in, in the field of social innovation and with my colleague in particular, Joanna Rosen, we wrote a paper on what co-production might be. You know, if you really want to understand what's happening in the local community and really envision solutions, we have to work in close concert with the community. We have to bring in people who are in government, people who are on the ground, who are organizers, so that we can actually affect change. Um, it has been and will continue to be and a privilege to walk alongside our partners in the two L.A. Promise Zones and beyond. 
so that we can actually uncover, first of all, what these challenges are to address both the short-term solutions, as our study hints at quite directly, um, and Javana spoke of around issues of and meeting the, the felt food needs, the healthcare issues, et cetera. And then to go beyond that to deal with the structural issues, whether it's structural issues in the housing market that are ever present um, and structural racism that continues to impact our communities both in South and Central Los Angeles. And so to that end, um, we look forward to working with you. We look forward to working with the HUD staff across the country, and we look forward for the opportunity to share these findings and how they resonate around the country so that we can actually design systems that provide more equity and, and just a better quality of life for people who are living in our communities. So with that, I'm happy to say goodbye for now, and we look forward to um, opportunities to engage in the future. Thank you. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.